Okay, great. Thank you, Marcel, and thank you for uh, organizing this. I know it's been quite a process. We had originally planned to actually come out to JPL uh, right about mid-March, and I'll never forget the conversation I had with Dr. Schaub in the lab to say, you know, I it looks like this coronavirus thing might be a, a huge problem. Maybe we should think about rescheduling the talk. And he kind of rolled his eyes and said, oh, you really think it'll be that bad? Um, and well, here we are uh, at last kind of uh, getting the opportunity to, to chat with all of you. Um, so hi, my name is Andrew Harris. Uh, I'm a fifth year student uh, in the AVS lab, as Marcel noted. Um, I'll go ahead and let Adam also introduce himself. Uh, hello, it's nice to be presenting to everybody today. My name is Adam Herman. I'm a second year PhD student in the AVS laboratory. Um, I've, I've uh, had a few come up to JPL, so um, I might seem familiar to some of you. Okay, great. Um, so getting right into it, uh, we'll be talking through kind of the uh, background motivation for this work, how we're formulating what we're calling the operations problem, uh, an overview of deep reinforcement learning, the challenges in the field as it relates to this kind of spacecraft domain, uh, a deep case study using Monte Carlo tree search to plan out ground contact opportunities, and then kind of a broad survey of future work. Uh, a big uh, reason why we're here and giving this talk is actually to get feedback from the JPL uh, scientific and engineering communities uh, to help kind of guide future work and also to refine uh, precisely what we're doing. Uh, I, I think someone might need to mute. We oui. um, can have a microphone open, please uh, turn it off. Um, I see a few ones open. Okay, go ahead. So, uh, okay. Actually, both Adam and I came into the space domain. Mm. Uh, okay, great. Um, both Adam and I came into the space domain through uh, University CubeSat projects. And so I think both of us kind of have this perspective that uh, the future in space is smaller, it's less expensive, and as a result, it's actually flying multiple spacecraft to enhance scientific objectives. Um, at the same time, uh, when we talk about distributed architectures, right, it sounds great in principle, and I think we've all read papers that uh, point to a few key examples, but in general, there is a huge operations overhead to uh, flying multiple spacecraft and especially to coordinating multiple spacecraft. And we actually see this in a lot of novel uh, high-end mission architectures, doing things like error breaking and error capture or deep space operations in general. Um, while there's a lot of uh, scientific and engineering merit to those approaches, you wind up essentially shifting costs from things like fuel into your operations overhead and into mission timelines. Uh, so kind of the, the high-level goal of this work is to try and mitigate those operational costs to these novel architectures and to improve their performance through the application of autonomy. And really the way that we're looking at operations here is a decision-making problem. What should the spacecraft be doing and where should it be doing it? So, of course, we're not the first people to come up with the idea of flying spacecraft autonomously. In fact, if you look back at the first spacecraft that were ever flown, they executed their missions without any input from the ground at all. And actually, those hard-coded behaviors are still found in contemporary missions. Uh, on the right here is a mode schedule for the uh, deep impact mission that was essentially constructed on the ground and executed autonomously on board because with light speed delay, uh, deep impact could not have been commanded to do what it did. Um, so at kind of the lowest level here is hard-coded behaviors, if else trees, uh, hard-coded timelines, that kind of thing. Uh, kind of on the other end of the spectrum are approaches that borrow uh, heavily from the logistics domain and apply various kinds of scheduling algorithms to spacecraft operations. Uh, a notable example here is JPL's Aspen tool and all of its associated uh, derivatives and variants, uh, which have been uh, hugely successful across a range of problems and have actually you know, flown on board. I'll never forget Steve Chen talking about the uh, <laughs> the success that EO1 had 
uh, in having a volcanologist wake up to a Google News alert of a volcano eruption and then signing into her account to see um, uh, pictures from the eruption from EO1 because it had autonomously uh, imaged the volcano. So uh, to some extent, that is the highest end of applied uh, spacecraft autonomy. Um, in this kind of middle domain are traditional optimization techniques. Uh, these typically formulate some specific aspect of the spacecraft operations problem, scheduling downlink, scheduling imaging, uh, that kind of thing. And they focus on optimizing that with minimal regard for upper system impacts. And that's mostly because the techniques that you use to solve that kind of optimization problem tend to scale poorly as you increase the dimensionality of that problem. Uh, so with that as the background, um, deep reinforcement learning is this entire field of work that has had kind of a, a boom since about 2013. I'm sure all of us have read news articles that talk about these uh, fantastic AIs that learn to beat chess grandmasters just by playing with themselves. Um, but there have been actual real successes from the application of these techniques, not only to things like uh, playing video games, but to doing things like data center power management or uh, the decision engines that most self-driving car uh, uh, approaches use tend to be rooted in deep reinforcement learning. And the reasons for that are essentially that uh, deep RL requires only a simulator of a, a specific problem archetype. It doesn't require some closed form analytical model that you then kind of uh, take partials of and work with in that way. Uh, and the strategies that you wind up learning are represented as a, a deep neural network, right? So you know, based on the size of that network, the maximum evaluation time that will take, uh, and you can accelerate that in hardware. So you have this nice combination of rapid execution of complicated plans uh, and also a lack of uh, analysis needed to formulate your problem. At the same time, uh, deep RL approaches tend to lack a rigorous performance and safety assurances, which we obviously want in the space domain. So kind of a, another high level goal here is to look at and adapt the uh, deep reinforcement learning approaches that have had so much success in other domains to a domain that we have more expertise in, right? Okay, so uh, when we say that uh, we need to formulate these problems for uh, deep reinforcement learning, what exactly are we talking about? So at a high level, talking about uh, spacecraft operations problems, you know, flying a spacecraft involves a lot of separate components. Uh, on one hand, you might have things like mission planning activities. Uh, someone has to design the spacecraft, uh, the flight software, the trajectories. There's a huge amount of effort that needs to be put in on that uh, front. Someone needs to come up with objectives uh, for the space mission, right? Uh, what are we going to image? What measurements are we going to take? Where and when are we going to take them? What is of value and what value can the space mission produce? And then at some point you wind up with Here's the hardware and software that we have. Here's what it's trying to do. Uh, how do we plan out activities, sequence them, and execute them while making sure that the spacecraft is still flyable? And from our perspective, that middle block is really the problem scope that we're trying to handle. Uh, planning out activities, uh, figuring out what order they should be executed in, and doing that in a responsive way that still meets the mission objectives. So to give a little bit more background on deep reinforcement learning, this is about as nasty as this presentation will get. Uh, deep RL techniques are focused on finding reward maximizing strategies on Markov decision processes by repeatedly interacting with them. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the deep part of deep RL is that uh, deep neural networks are used to represent the policy that maps from observed states in the Markov process two actions that need to be taken. So in general, the way that these methods work is that they uh, kind of explore around in the problem space to collect information on uh, how states uh, transition into each other, how their actions affect that, and where uh, rewards are in the environment. They use some kind of Bellman-derived method to assign a value to visited state action reward tuples. They regress a neural network to predict those values uh, and then finally, they use that neural network 
to predict what combinations of states and actions will maximize that value. So that is kind of the, the view from 10,000 feet of what these uh, methods are trying to do. Uh, there has been a huge pile of uh, research that has been done on DeepRL, uh, various loss functions, hyperparameter selection, network architectures. That ultimately is not a focus of this work. We're kind of taking the, uh, the mentality of, if we really need to hand tune these methods to work on our problems, it likely is not a good fit uh, in the first place. So most of the work that you'll see here was done using uh, simple fully connected networks uh, with an off the shelf implementation of proximal policy optimization. Okay, so uh, we have three hurdles that we think are kind of the core problems for applying these techniques to planning and space domains. The first one is quite frankly, problem identification. What problems are and aren't well suited through these DRL approaches? What problems do we already have good enough tools for? Uh, again, I'm sure all of us have been uh, in presentations where we kind of see, you know, uh, growing deep learning to, to predict the value or the output of the two-body equation, right? And when you look at things like that, it's very hard to think or hard to not think, you know, we know the two-body equation. We don't want to relearn it. We want to actually solve a problem that is hard for us today. So with that being said, and starting with the hypothesis that uh, spacecraft operations is a problem like that, how do we represent these common problems in spacecraft management? Uh, number two is safety and verification. Uh, even if we train an agent and it can solve these problems and it's well suited, can we actually make sure that it is uh, safe enough or trustworthy enough to be flown or to use the outputs of uh, in a mission? And how can we test agents on the ground before flying them and get some assurances that way? And number three is data sparsity. Uh, deep learning methods are famously great when you have huge files of data, but unfortunately in the spacecraft domain, we often don't. Uh, so how can we use the data that we have more efficiently how well can we substitute or augment what we have with simulated data? And how can we leverage existing knowledge about spacecraft operations to bootstrap or improve these AI-driven uh, operations agents? Okay, so uh, a quick note here on what kind of actual implementation we're talking about here. In general, the architecture we have in mind when we talk about these things is that you have a uh, an agent that is trained on the ground in some uh, moderate fidelity simulator. It is verified on the ground uh, using some higher fidelity simulator. And then that static pre-trained agent is thrown at the decision-making problem. So we're not uh, currently focusing on, can you actually you know, throw this uh, machine learning agent on board and have it learn how to fly the spacecraft literally on the fly. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but it is largely due to the data intensity of training one of these agents. Uh, so in general, also, we view this as kind of a reactive uh, approach. So we're not necessarily looking at, here's a timeline of events. We're looking at, here's the current system state. What action should I take in response to that system state? And given a, a model of the problem, you could extend that out to get an action sequence. So that's kind of at a high level what we're talking about here. Okay, so uh, all of this stuff, as I mentioned, is going to be uh, trained in simulation at some level. Uh, there are a lot of constraints on having good simulators to solve these problems. That's namely that uh, many approaches choke on moving from simulation to reality, because if you haven't modeled every dynamic, or if you've missed important dynamics around the edges, uh, you will not generalize from sim. This is called the simulation gap. Uh, so we want something that's accurate enough uh, that simulates these kind of edge dynamics that might be important, that can be evaluated rapidly enough to support the data intensity as I mentioned before. And also it'd be great if we don't have to write a ton of blue code to wrap it into uh, the frameworks that we need to do deep learning. Uh, so for all this, uh, coming out of the ABS lab, we use the ABS Basilisk Gastrodynamics Toolkit. Uh, it is open source, uh, and actually all of the environments I talk about, uh, you can go look up on GitHub, Basilisk, and, and download them and play with them yourself. Uh, so it, again, checks our boxes for uh, speed, 
Uh, you can modify it to achieve the necessary fidelity. Uh, and because it is all at the end of the day, uh, an API, uh, Python API, the C++ code, it's very easy to glue together to whatever uh, machine learning toolkit you want to use. So uh, with that being said, we have three key reference problems that I'll talk through. Uh, the first is this Mars station keeping environment, and it's primarily a, a regulation problem. You have a spacecraft that's trading, uh, spending time on a scientific mission with doing uh, station keeping in response to perturbations. So it can either do uh, orbit determination, it can maneuver, or it can uh, do science. And that's uh, essentially a toy problem in this domain. We have very simple uh, exponential growth and decay models for the controller and estimator. It's all superimposed on essentially two-body uh, plus J2 dynamics. So that's really meant to be, you know, a an initial run through of very the dominant challenges. You can only do so many things at a time. Um, can we handle nonlinear dynamics? So on and so forth. Uh, next, we have a, a Leo Earth observation operations problem. And here we actually move to using that fancy high fidelity basilisk based simulator that actually incorporates flight heritage uh, attitude control components, specifically the uh, desaturation stack. So here you have a spacecraft that needs to, uh, again, maximize the amount of time it can spend doing its scientific mission while balancing that with a very constrained power supply uh, and uh, disturbance torques that saturate your reaction wheels, right? So how do you juggle those different tasks? And last but not least is the science and communication environment that Adam developed that directly extends the science operation environment, but rather than simply maximizing the time spent doing science, uh, you also need to downlink that science. And so uh, I'll skip through these because it's essentially uh, what I've just said. Um, uh, yeah, you wind up, rather than rewarding the agent based on just time spent doing science, you actually reward it based on what has gotten down to the ground. Okay, so I mentioned Markov decision processes earlier without actually uh, introducing, or introducing them in a rigorous way. Um, Markov decision processes are a framework for representing decision-making problems. They have a couple key properties. Specifically, they're Markovian, meaning that you can infer trajectories knowing only one state. You do not need a history of states. Uh, and they are decision processes, meaning that uh, you can take actions in that process to influence the evolution of it. So rigorously, there are a tuple of states belonging to some set of states, actions and some set of actions, uh, and transition functions that map previous state action pairs to future state action pairs. In addition, MDPs also include reward functions that essentially define the objective of the system. Uh, and there's a transition function associated there. Uh, Technically, we are working in POM DPs. We do not give the agent the full state information for the system. Uh, we instead pick parameterizations of those states uh, to act as the decision space. So we're largely working in solutions that approximate POM DPs as MDPs. And so a key question here is actually how you formulate these MDPs from the actual decision-making problems that we have. How do you go from something that is uh, continuous time, real value, maybe a set of device states into kind of this nice, discrete Markovian process. And that turns out to be really difficult. And even more importantly, it dramatically impacts whether or not the uh, fancy algorithms that I've mentioned before work at all. Okay, so uh, a few key things that we need to get out of the way. Um, how are we actually formulating this MVP from the, the continuous problem I've mentioned before? Uh, one key question is time. Um, many approaches use timeline-based scheduling, uh, where essentially you say, it's this time I have interrupts to do these actions at these future times. Uh, instead, like I mentioned, we're really taking kind of a flight guidelines approach to say, we want to look at the current system states as they are and map that to what action best fits the mission objectives given the current state. Uh, another key question is how we actually specify what the agent should do via the reward. But we take the perspective that having very simple rewards based on mission objectives usually trumps doing uh, reward engineering and including penalties on undesirable behavior and that kind of thing. 
an underexplored question in this domain is using expert-derived reward specification to do that. We essentially right now are at a point where we're treating scientific objectives are you want to just maximize the amount of time you spend doing science, not you want to image these specific targets. That's uh, an area we'll touch on again in future work. So uh, the real uh, core of the MDP conversion problem is actually how you represent states and actions, because this is how you can incorporate prior knowledge into the environment design. Uh, our concept here is to discretize actions using operational modes, which is a common approach needed anyway to do uh, spacecraft operations. You can see on the right the very simple operations flow diagram for a uh, for the ASU Phoenix CubeSat. Uh, kind of a, a hypothesis that we have here is that this is analogous to having a hybrid system representation of spacecraft behaviors. You are switching into discrete modes, and that will impact how the system states, things like battery charge, reaction wheels, even the orbit that you're in if you have a maneuver mode, uh, evolve over time. And further, we can design those modes such that we are Lyapunov stable in a subset of that kind of internal state space. That lets us actually apply uh, multiple Lyapunov functions to kind of visualize whether or not we have a stabilizing controller here, if not uh, define them directly given the mission objective. So we have this kind of uh, Lyapunov dimensionality reduction hypothesis that instead of observing states, we observe the uh, corresponding Lyapunov functions that are stabilized by those states. Um, so when we apply that to the uh, bar science station keeping problem, what we actually find is that it, it turns out to give you much better results than kind of a naive implementation where you allow the agent to learn relationships between the states. You can see that this uh, blue line traces out the naive implementation, and then as we apply more and more uh, expert knowledge into the state uh, architecture, you wind up getting better and better results. Uh, so this is one example of the kinds of research that we're doing in how to formulate these problems, uh, rather than specifically just throwing uh, uh, deeply tuned deep networks at them. Okay, so this helps us transition into the, the feasibility and challenges specific to these uh, approaches. One of the key questions is how complex are these problems actually? Uh, and how do they relate to other problems that we know have been successfully start, solved in the deep learning domain? One way that you can characterize this is to look at what's called the intrinsic dimensionality of these problems. And one way that you can determine that is through random substate sampling. Essentially, what we're doing here is uh, pruning a huge chunk of the, the full neural network, training it on a problem, and seeing the, the terminal performance that we get out of it and comparing that against the baseline. Then we iteratively grow the size of that current network until we start to hit acceptable performance, again, according to a baseline. So you can see this process happening here uh, on the upper left figure, where as we grow the dimensionality of the neural network that we're using, we get better and better performance up to a baseline, right? Uh, and so there's a, a kind of cutoff range, just so you're not picking the, the actual best performance you can get, which likely requires a huge network. Uh, but it helps us kind of gauge both uh, how complex of a network do you need, how big of a network do you need, but also what is the upper bound on the uh, minimum, the number of parameters you need to solve a problem with a solver, right? So it is both a, uh, it represents both the problem complexity and the solver complexity. You see this in the, uh, the original paper on the subject, looking at things like image processing, where applying certain image processing architectures results in a much simpler uh, and smaller network than using something like a, a fully connected net. Uh, so when we apply this to our problems, uh, again, claiming that they're representative, what we find is that actually we're situated right between other classic deep learning benchmarks, things like CIFAR-10 and uh, the Atari Pong deep learning environment. We're actually slightly simpler than Atari Pong on the lower end and a little bit bigger than it on the upper end. So the fact that we wind up with these uh, similar intrinsic dimensionality results suggests that these approaches will scale to more uh, complex and realistic operations problems, 
without requiring an enormous amount of compute. Another uh, huge question with deep RL is how sensitive are you to hyperparameters? Uh, in general, deep reinforcement learning techniques are very sensitive to hyperparameters. Uh, we've done some hyperparameter analysis, and what we find is essentially that uh, while we're not insensitive to it, we also tend to get decent performance across a wide range of network architectures and hyperparameters, which solves that early question that I had mentioned about uh, you know, if this is so sensitive, you need to run it 10 times and one seed works anyways, is it really useful? And again, what we're, uh, what we're positing here is that we're not that sensitive to hyperparameters and random seed. And as a result, uh, broadly, you can expect these techniques to work on problems that you apply them to without doing a huge amount of spinning. Last but not least, how do we compare to other uh, black box solution approaches uh, and we use genetic algorithms as kind of a punching bag here, but also because they're in this domain of solvers that will work on more or less arbitrary problems you give them. They're one of the only candidates that is probably known and applied. Uh, so here we set up a timeline-based genetic algorithm with genes reflecting a particular timeline-based action sequence and ran it on exactly the same uh, station keeping environment as our PPO2-based agent and what we find is that we wind up reaching similar terminal performance in uh, both training and evolution, uh, but the deep RL approach does so, you know, two orders of magnitude faster in terms of the number of interactions with the environment required. Uh, so it actually turns out to be substantially more computationally efficient, especially if the environment is expensive to evaluate. Um, this is somewhat apples to oranges because we're comparing both the efficiency of a timeline-based scheduler uh, and the efficiency of both optimizers. But in general, it shows that we're at least competitive with them. We're not, you know, chasing rabbits with something that's 10 times worse than uh, a similar approach. We're more or less uh, the same or faster. Okay, uh, so I also mentioned that we talked about safety here. Uh, and while it seems like deep RL does work for these problems, the deep RL and MDP framework doesn't immediately admit a concept of safety because it tends to focus on and optimize mean returns. As an example here, this classic approach of training an agent to walk along the cliff to a goal uh, kind of illustrates this, right? Imagine that you have some wind that maybe occasionally pushes you uh, south or down in this image. So the safe path is to walk far away and give yourself some buffer, but the time optimal path is to walk right along the edge and occasionally fall down. One way that you can get safety is one thing that's been broadly tried is to just penalize unsafe behavior. You can imagine, uh, you know, maybe R minus 100 is not sufficient. Maybe you make it R minus 1,000. And a ton of these reward uh, engineering approaches exist that do exactly that. Um, the problem with reward engineering is that it, it tends to fail in generalization. And so if your training environment is at all different than your evaluation environment, you can get very undesirable behavior. And here as an example is an agent that was trained to, uh, to play a boat racing game. The scientist doing this said, oh, well, it's not doing that great because it never picks up power-ups. They gave the agent a, a reward for picking up power-ups. You can see it just, learns to sit in a circle and pick up power-ups because per the reward function that was specified, this turned out to maximize uh, the overall returns. Uh, so in the safety problem, the question that we need to ask is, sure, the, the penalty for failure is high enough uh, to prevent it in the training environment, but what will it do you know, if that cliff is a bit longer? So, uh, one way to solve that problem is actually to outsource safety properties to other tools. Uh, and this entire process is called shielded uh, learning. So rather than just letting the agent kind of run wild in the environment, the actions taken by the agent are checked by a shield function that has some knowledge of safe and unsafe uh, state action combinations. Uh, and it turns out these shields are relatively easy to formulate using control synthesis. You can formulate a low dimensional uh, Markov process that represents the safety behavior of the system. 
and then construct strategies on that process uh, by using techniques like two-player safety games. And on top of that, uh, the temporal logic specifications that you need to generate those kinds of safe algorithms are incredibly complex for solving the general optimization problem are remarkably simple when you only need them to solve the safety problem. Uh, so in this case, you actually get kind of the benefits of both tools because the deep RL agent can go ahead and explore and solve uh, whatever wacky nonlinear dynamics you have in general. And then as you approach the well-known edge cases for your system, uh, the shield that you have kind of specified kicks in to keep you in that uh, safe playpen. So again, what we find here is that uh, when we apply the shielded learning approach and compare that with an unshielded approach with increasing penalties for failure, um, what we find is that the shielded approach converges much more quickly to the target uh, policy, uh, and the unshielded approaches take far longer. It's not shown on this plot, uh, but in general, you know, the speed of convergence is not improved by penalizing failure. Um, and on top of that, when we look at generalization, uh, the shielded agent winds up being competitive across a larger range of uh, environment parameters than the unshielded agent. So again, this is a little bit apples to oranges. The unshielded agent we know did not do well in the nominal condition, but the fact that the shield actually does buy you some robustness uh, in terms of things like spacecraft inertia and power consumption is promising for generalization down the line. Okay, and so I think with all of that being said and kind of the stage being set, I'm going to pass things over to Adam uh, to talk through his deep dive into Leo downlink scheduling Monte Carlo tree search. Adam? Great, <clears throat> thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, so as Andrew uh, said, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of a deep dive into one of the specific problems, reference problems he was talking about earlier. Um, so here I'm applying Monte Carlo tree search um, and neural net regression um, over the, the MCTS value data. I'm applying that to the, the science and communications problem. So a little bit on the motivation. Andrew, if you could click next so you can get some text to pop up. Um, so Monte Carlo tree search is an online search algorithm that means it continually interacts with uh, a simulated environment while stepping through a real environment. And that way, you're only exploring states that are reachable from your current state. And so what we're looking to do here is take the uh, this online search algorithm and apply it to offline training. Um, and it has some nice properties. So as the number of simulations per step through the environment approaches infinity, it will converge to the optimal policy. Um, given enough computational resources, it, it could be useful for real-time search onboard spacecraft, but uh, more likely than not, you would just want to regress over the, the state action value data uh, to produce a neural network that can be rapidly executed. Um, and it, it also produces a deterministic policy, um, so it avoids some of the safety concerns of stochastic policies um, and is, is kind of actually well suited for, for the shielding as well, which I'll get into uh, a little bit down the line. Um, uh, one of the um, one of the motivations for this was was the su success of uh, AlphaGo, um, which is a Go playing reinforcement learning agent uh, created by DeepMind. Uh, it was pretty popular um, when it was able to beat Lisa Dahl in, uh, in 2016 in a five game match. Um, and it, it really did, did, it really handled a large state in action space well and learned on self play alone. So, um, well, we're not applying AlphaGo in this problem. Um, it is something we're interested in doing in the future and kind of is what motivated some of this work. So, next slide. Okay, so I'll give a, a, a real quick overview on how Monte Carlo research works for those that are not familiar. As I stated, it's an online search algorithm. Um, so uh, next slide, Andrew. I think it actually has a better summary than this one. A little repetitive here. There we go. So it incrementally steps through the real environment by running a, a predetermined number of simulations per step. And it follows this basic process here 
um, where it selects an action based off of an intermediate state action value function that it's made through simulation and some exploration bonus. Um, if it reaches a state that it has never visited before, it just initializes uh, some things and then executes a rollout policy all the way to the end of your planning horizon where it either randomly selects actions or uh, selects actions or modes in this case based on some heuristic policy. And this is where the shielding that Andrew was talking about comes in hand because you could just execute the shield as the rollout policy to tell the agent, um, this is where the safe states are and, and this is where you should search for reward. Um, and then after rollout, you just back up your reward uh, through the tree to update those intermediate Q values. Uh, do this a, a number of times, select the action with the highest Q value and then repeat the process at the next state. Um, next slide. So um, one of the things that I did with MCTS was uh, ran a, a pretty extensive hyperparameter search um, while varying the, um, the exploration constant and the number of simulations per step. Um, and what we found here was that given the right exploration constant, you actually converge to, the, to a near optimal solution uh, very, very quickly, um, but you converge very slowly to the actual optimal solution. So the important metric here, and it's in the chart on the right, is the average downlink utilization. And what that is, is the um, how much of the downlink windows the agent utilized. So at only 10 simulations per step, um, for you know a total of 450 simulations uh, through the whole planning horizon, uh, you can reach a maximum of 97% downlink utilization for MCTS, um, but maybe 99% for a genetic algorithm. Um, so the genetic algorithm we're using to put kind of an upper bound on performance and show what our optimality gap is, but we actually get very close very quickly. Um, next slide. And so one of the questions that we had was, uh, can these near optimal policies generated by MCTS be generalized using a neural network? Um, and so what we do is we construct the search tree with MCTS. Uh, we take the reward that the agent actually received um, while stepping through the environment, and then we back that up through the tree to create uh, to compute the value along the main tree. And then next slide you can assemble a number of trees for randomly seeded initial conditions um, by solving the planning problem, uh, split up the data, randomize it, and train it over a variety of neural networks. Um, and that's what we do here. And then we also validate the performance of each network. Um, so next slide, I think I have some data on that. Yeah, so here, this was a, a hyperparameter search I conducted. Uh, this is uh, hot off the press, brand new data. Um, so we used an exploration bonus of about 500, um, which is very, very reward dependent, but it worked well for this problem, and only 10 simulations per step. Um, and so by solving, you know, 1,200 uh, problems in the, the uh, LEO science and communications problem, we were able to get very good performance when training neural networks on that data. So we were pretty robust to the, the hyperparameters um, for this for this general architecture, with the exception of the uh, alpha parameter, which, you know, at, at 0 0.5 slope for x less than zero, uh, your performance starts to drop off a little bit. Um, and so on the next slide, what I did was I took um, each of the uh, each of the networks that achieved more than 95% downlink utilization, and I wanted to look at what their general behavior was. So this chart uh, was pretty interesting, and what it does is it breaks down the average uh, percentage of time in the planning horizon each network was spending in each mode. Um, so in the, the network highlighted in red, um, it spends you know maybe 30% of the time downlinking, um, but it's achieving 95% downlink utilization, which is a pretty good uh, I think case for, for arguing that the agent is in fact learning where the ground stations are based on the planet centered, planet fixed radius and velocity vectors. Um, some of these other networks though, you know, they're spending 70% of the time downlinking. It's probably not behavior you actually want in a, in a real mission, um, but they're still achieving that performance. So 
I think this tells us that there, there's we can push this problem a little bit more. Um, maybe the, the environment itself is a little bit too uh, forgiving. Um, but also the networks uh, can learn the planet-centered, planet-fixed um, radius and velocity vectors and how they relate to uh, ground station access. And so that bodes well for future work or if we want to do maybe multi-target imaging and input their states um, as states, or, or I'm sorry, their locations as states um, and select each one as an action. Um, okay, next slide. I think that was it, right? Yeah it, yeah, it looks like it. So I guess to kind of summarize here, uh, we've concocted a novel application of deep reinforcement learning and, and deep Monte Carlo tree search uh, to an MVP-based formulation of the spacecraft operation planning problem. Uh, from what we've seen in our, our initial kind of studies in this domain, they do seem well suited to solve the full mission planning and operation problem that includes not only uh, scientific task planning, but also uh, spacecraft health management. Uh, we've got simulation tools uh, and reference scenarios in spacecraft operations problems. Again, those are, are readily available. Uh, and we're also trying to vet out kind of best uh, practices and frameworks for implementing these techniques in the future. Uh, so to kind of jog everyone's uh, mind here, some uh, things that we've kind of brought up haphazardly as future work. Uh, one question is doing, you know, single spacecraft, many uh, science target uh, imaging scenarios, uh, some questions about like what makes a quality image, how do we represent imaging priorities, scaling that into the multi-spacecraft, multi-target, multi-downlink scenario. Maybe you have a, a constellation that's trying to image targets that appear. You know, how do we coordinate many of these agents? Uh, small body autonomy uh, with probabilistic motion planning. Obviously, that's a huge domain for future approaches in uh, autonomous operations. Uh, and things like dynamic science observation targeting, really there we're trying to channel the uh, Enceladus plume targeting uh, work that others have done. How do you maximize your odds of observing cool targets? Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and thank all of you for coming uh, and open the floor to questions for all of us. So um, guys, I think we, we already have one from Isa Nesnas, um, and he's asking, to what extent is the learning context specific, e.g. communicating down to earth on slide 39? Yeah, I think I can answer that question. Um, it's very context specific. So the locations of each ground station are fixed, um, and we don't vary the number of ground stations. Um, you could, uh, I guess, make it a little bit more context agnostic um, if you maybe fix the number of ground stations, but um, have their lat long coordinates input into the the problem is states. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, actually, if I may chime in here, um, I was thinking more on the spacecraft side. So if the situation on the spacecraft side is a little bit different from what you anticipated or trained, to what extent you have some level of robustness if you have to do certain maneuvers uh, that puts you in uh, something that's outside which you have assumed, is there certain resilience to that type of scenario or is it fairly sensitive? Yeah, so that, that's actually a great question regarding the robustness. Let me see if I can put to a backup slide here that talks about that. Um, so this is for the, the shielded agent. Um, and really what I'm trying to show in this case plot here is that the agent actually winds up learning decision boundaries in the observation space, right? So the benefit to that kind of approach is that, you know, if you wind up finding that on board, maybe your power drains 20% faster uh, than you expected it to in training, you know, the agent doesn't necessarily care about the, uh, the rate at which it trains, but it does care that you're above a safety threshold, right? So uh, to some extent, as Adam noted, you are definitely dependent on the environment in which you train. But to some extent, this kind of state-driven uh, asking framework buys you robustness almost in an analogous way to the fact that uh, control feedback buys you robustness. But Andrew, I think the question is also like orbit maneuvers, right? You didn't, could you just talk about what, if you trained on something like 7,000 kilometer radii and now you're at 7,100 kilometers for some reason? 
Yeah, so so that kind of overfitting is endemic in DeepRL. There, there's this joke that DeepRL is training on the test set. Uh, and so what we do to kind of mitigate that is actually to train on randomly sampled orbits and with randomly sampled initial conditions. So yeah. we're seeing essentially the results of an agent that is randomly initialized somewhere in LEO at like a 400 kilometer altitude. Um, so to some, from that perspective, I would say pretty confidently, yes, we're not uh, super dependent on the specific uh, orbit. Okay, and, and just to, if I may quick, quick follow up and, I'll, and then I'll yield to other people. Sure. So if, 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 you, if you did vary the orbits um, and then you trained within the network, but in the reality, if something happened outside the our orbit you trained, I know you can interpolate, but can you extrapolate? Would it be able to extrapolate or is it very sensitive to extrapolation? Yeah, so that, that is an extremely good question. And while we haven't necessarily studied extrapolation in that sense, we have studied uh, the response to parametric uncertainty. So not necessarily what if your orbit was higher, but what if you, you know, burned more mass after a maneuver than you expected? What we find there, too, is that uh, especially after the, the application of the shielding approach, we do get pretty good robustness of, uh, for a reasonable range of that parametric variation. Does that make Thank sense? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's helpful. I think we'll, we'll look, for, uh, look further into this. Thanks. Great. Thanks. And we have another question from Michael Stockridge. Um, computing the times at which a ground station is accessible is fairly fast. The more interesting problem to me is decisions about whether or not to use the ground station access intervals and how much. Have you investigated that aspect? Um, I think I'll an I can answer that question. I, I think that's a, that's a great question and it's a great point um, and I agree with it. Uh, I think future work should investigate this. It doesn't right now, but you know, in a, in a realistic operational scenario where you're you're having to use uh, maybe highly constrained uh, ground stations. You can't just downlink whenever you want. You have to, I don't know, probably queue a downlink or coordinate with other spacecraft. So something I'm interested in looking at, uh, but but haven't done so yet. Yeah, I, I think something I would tack on to that is that, uh, and this is true in the power case too, we definitely have big problems where there are limiting uh, dynamics, like in the downlink opportunity problem. You essentially always, just because the, the rate of data coming in from the camera is so high and your storage is limited, you almost always want to be downlinking when, it, when you have an opportunity. So a question that's come mm -hmm. up a lot as we kind of create these scenarios is, how do we make sure that we've created an interesting enough problem uh, that the results we get out of it will be compelling. And that's another place that we're uh, definitely looking for input from the actual science and engineering communities. We have another interesting question from John Day, uh, who's asking, or he's saying, uh, you mentioned the difficulty of transforming a domain into partially observable parts of precision processes. Are you planning future work or research to mitigate this difficulty? Yeah, I, I, hmm, I have a hard time answering that because I'm also planning to defend uh, in the next couple months, so I don't want to promise too much. But I think it's definitely uh, a major area of work uh, and something that we're hoping to do is also to have uh, more work done on model-based RL, which is related because you're, you're learning not only this uh, policy that maps you from states to actions, but you're actually fitting a model to the system you're observing uh, as you do that. And so I think that leaves open the potential for uh, actually learning representations rather than kind of hand fitting them with expert knowledge. Um, so I'd say that there, there's a huge amount of future work in that domain. Uh, all of us come from an astrodynamics background where I think uh, picking your favorite parameterization to, to optimize some control or estimation objective is kind of half of the field. Um, so I, I would say Yes, but also no. I guess Adam can take it on. Um, Pat Kennelly is asking a somewhat leading but genuine question relating to your use of Atlas and general toolset and tool chain. I'm curious to hear how you've been approaching simulating both the discrete event driven, discrete event systems aspect alongside 
the uh, continuous such as dynamic parts of the system together? It is a good question. Um, I know Pat is very familiar with bath flows, but essentially what we're doing here is uh, it goes back to how I mentioned we're discretizing time. So we uh, split the entire timeline of a scenario into decision uh, or uh, action durations. Um, and then essentially we evaluate at the action duration, pick uh, a system mode to enter into, and then let the simulation run in that uh, action set for the action duration, right? So the way that's done actually in Basilisk is uh, it is not using the event system. It's using kind of a, a custom re-implementation of the event system. Um, but Basilisk natively supports uh, doing that kind of interrupt-driven uh, simulation. So we get both uh, the continuous time dynamics by actually running the sim and the discrete time dynamics by essentially stopping the sim, pulling outputs, looking at them, making a decision, and then restarting it. I just I want to just highlight here on that too with the sim side that you know we're not just saying point at the sun and magic it points at the sun. You say point at the sun, flight algorithms have to fire up, the sensors have to get processed, signals, controls happen, sends torques to the wheels, to thrusters, it starts reorienting. If Andrew was the side every two minutes a new task, but it takes it five minutes to finish a maneuver, you know, you would be getting just rubbish. So this discretization you're talking about it was very critical, right, that you give it enough of an event horizon for these flight modes to have gone into and start to do something. Yeah, and actually that, uh, that reminds me that some work that we do have planned is investigating um, how the interplay between the control uh, uh, yeah, you know, that control duration versus the settling time of your controllers winds up defining whether or not your system is Markov or not, right? So it is very important to pick good durations for that, such that you you still uphold the assumptions that underlie the policy. Because when you have systems that are, are not Markovian, and especially if you have systems that are strongly non-stationary, it is very difficult to bring good performance out of DRL. I think that Patrick is asking that also because he's running into the same end of question with his own work up here at JPL. Oh, yes. Um, any, any other questions? You don't need to type the question. You can just ask if you want. Okay, then hearing none, um, I think we can stop here. Um, I'll be, I think that we can share the slides, right, guys? Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and send you a copy of them. So I'll send you the slides and I'll, and I'll make the recording available for everyone. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, Adam, and HP for coming today. Uh, this was a great talk. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks for having us over and uh, despite all the COVID stuff. And again, we're looking for feedback. So if you have some ideas and go, hey, how about this is a particular challenging thing because you guys are flying all these satellites and spacecraft in all kinds of domains. Uh, we're all eager to see you know, what other environments should we try to train this stuff on that would uh, test the algorithm. So please reach out to us. On the website, you can easily, so hanspeterschaub.info, you can just type it in Google, it finds me. You can find Andrew and Adam as well. Yeah, likewise myself, thank you again for setting this up. Uh, again, it's, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> but I, I deeply appreciate the opportunity. And thanks yeah. to the whole audience for attending and, and having great questions. Yeah, no Thank you all. I agree. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thanks.